here, Latinx, I mean, there's a large number of countries with Spanish-speaking immigrants. And so it's not actually, um, it doesn't make any sense to actually group everyone together all the time. And so we'll talk a little bit about when it is and when it's not. Um, and I want to talk specifically about Cubans, Mexicans, and Hondurans, because those are the three largest groups that are here in New Orleans. And unlike, again, the Italians and Irish, we're really talking about much smaller numbers when we're talking about, say, Cuban migrants or Mexican migrants and even Honduran migrants. Um, but instead, New Orleans, because of, again, its geographical position um, near the Caribbean, near the Gulf Coast, is often seen as a gateway to Central America, to the Caribbean. We have larger numbers of people sometimes coming through. Um, but the numbers who are staying in New Orleans, I should say, are modest. Um, and yet we have what I think of, not so much the push-pull, but as transnational networks because of trade, um, because of personal connections, and sometimes because of revolution, we have people from the Caribbean coming into New Orleans, sometimes staying, sometimes going back to Central America and the Caribbean, sometimes staying here in the United States. So briefly, um, I want to talk first about Caribbean in terms of thinking about Cubans. Um, so early numbers of Cubans who came largely came during the Cuban Revolution of 1898 and 1895. So again, I want to say, often we think about Latino immigrants in New Orleans, we think, oh, it's all post-Katrina. And that's the other thing I want to correct. It is not all post-Katrina. There is a long history um, of these Spanish-speaking <laughs> immigrants coming into New Orleans in the 19th and the 20th century. And some of the most interesting, I think, do come from this moment in the late 19th century. So I do study Cuba and Cuban-American relations. And interestingly, we do have large numbers, or some modest numbers of Cubans coming into New Orleans as part of a revolutionary movement. And these are names you might recognize, like Antonio Maceo or Jose Marti. They come to New Orleans, they write, they're raising money. But the idea is not to stay in New Orleans. The idea is to go back to Cuba and become part of a revolutionary movement. Um, there are, however, and the numbers are relatively small. There are cultural connections between Cuba and the United States. But there's not really a large Cuban-American population until after the Cuban Revolution of 1959. And it's at that point where, when Cubans are coming largely to the United States, you begin to have large numbers of Cubans settling in New Orleans. More go to Miami, for sure, and more go to New York, more go to New Jersey, but we begin to have hundreds of people coming into New Orleans. But again, these are not tens of thousands. These are, again, more modest numbers. Um, they come in, partially some is like um, Laura was selling because they're Catholic, and they also see this as you know, a Catholic city. Some become because of larger connections to New Orleans. Um, some come because of the cultural sense of the Spanish world. Um, and by the 1970s, there are about 5,000 Cubans in New Orleans. So the numbers, again, are modest, but this is really the same generation that are moving to Miami or New York. And we get the sort of Cuban settlement here. Later, there'll be other Cubans who also come to New Orleans that will come after 1980 um, with the Mariel Boatlift, and again in the 1990s, which is the Balseros. These tend to be more working class Cubans, more Cubans of color. The Cubans who come in the 1950s, 1960s, tend to identify as white, tend to be slightly better off. And so you even have splits among the Cubans who come and settle in New Orleans. The second group I want to mention are Mexicans. Again, we have um, modest numbers of Mexicans, particularly in relationship to places like Texas or California. The numbers are never anywhere near as large as those groups. Um, and the Mexicans who come again in the 1920s tend to be more middle class, which is something I think which is useful to think about. They tend to be more professional um, and very different from the idea of agricultural workers who are working in places like Texas or even California. This is because they're not crossing the border to work in agriculture. Rather, they're getting on a ship from Veracruz um, or from another Mexican port city. They tend to be more likely to be in business, to be more in trade, to be more professional class. And as a result, they tend to be of a somewhat higher social status. If you're interested in this, I would recommend my colleague book by Julie Weiss. She has a book called Corazon de Dixie, which is about early Mexican immigrants in the South before the 
1960s. She has great work on Mexicans in New Orleans. And she really argued that they largely identify as white, that they are able to, in fact, be seen as um, articulated as white while they live in Louisiana and New Orleans, unlike other immigrant groups. Um, many of them, again, come as entrepreneurs, as diplomats, as academics. Many also are early international students at Tulane and Loyola. And so we have a way in which this early Mexican population does not look the way we think of Mexican immigrants today, but is in fact coming from this higher status, more professional class, who are able to make their way in New Orleans through professional networks. So we think about Mexicans, particularly in the mid-century, um, I think it's a somewhat unexpected way in which those politics play out. And then I want to talk a little bit about Hondurans, because New Orleans has definitely um, become more and more associated with Honduran migration. Um, and particularly, and I'll talk about this when we talk more about um, nativism and anti-immigrant sentiment, um, this really is affecting our Honduran and our Central American community today. But there's a way in which this is also tied to a politics of trade and networks, not so much about this push-pull. And this is because of the banana industry. And many of you may be familiar with Sam Zamuri and United <coughs> Fruit Company here in New Orleans, but because of this, um, New Orleans has had a very specific relationship to Honduras throughout the 20th century. I teach at Tulane University. The president's house is the former um, residence of Sam Zamuri. Much of my funding is from the Stone Center. This is also Zamuri funding, which creates you know, a contradiction of what many scholars would see sort of a neo-colonial, if not imperial, presence of US you know, banana trade in Central America, and how did that actually fund those of us who study Latin America at Tulane today. But this also does create networks for migration. This is, again, largely through the banana industry, right? Because New Orleans is the support for bananas. Um, but again, these are modest numbers. These are not huge. These are not hundreds of thousands, like we're talking about Irish or Italian. These are thousands, you know, thousands of people coming in, but not more than that. By the 1980s and 1990s, there are about 10,000 Hondurans here. But because of the relatively low numbers of Latinx migrants more broadly in New Orleans, um, there's about the same number of Hondurans as there are Mexicans, which means that for Mexicans, they feel that they're living in a Honduran space because the Hondurans actually sort of have an equal number um, as do the Mexicans. Um, there's also because um, the Hondurans make up a larger community here, again, proportionately than they do to other migrant groups. There actually are more Hondurans in places like Los Angeles. But because the numbers overall are lower and are more parity than Mexicans, there is a perception that the Honduran community here is much larger than it is if you actually look at the census numbers. Um, and I'm taking this from my colleague's um, book by Annie Gibson, as well as of a colleague who's at, well, I'm looking at after as I wrote it down, uh, by um, Andrew Sluter and Case Watkins. But they have a new book that's called Hispanic and Latino New Orleans, um, which they really sort of break down this relationship between the Mexicans and the Hondurans. In addition, after Hurricane Mitch, um, Hondurans receive what's called temporary protection status, which means it's too dangerous to go back to Honduras to get a protective status. And that is now, they've had that status now often for 20 years, but that is now at risk as the Trump administration has taken protective status away from Haitians as well as um, Hondurans, so people now are at greater risk of being sent back. And particularly, and I'll talk about this more again when we talk about nativism, it is true that large numbers of Hondurans and other Central Americans come after Katrina. They come largely to work in the construction and the rebuilding of New Orleans. Um, and so today, the Honduran community and the Central American community is far more visible in the post-Katrina era, um, but they've also faced a greater degree of discrimination. Um, and there's another new good book, which I would suggest by my colleague Dana Frank, called The Long Honduran Night, that talks also about the violence in Honduras, which is also bringing Hondurans to the United States in large numbers, as many of you might be reading about. And New Orleans has been a place where many of those Honduran migrants have come, and families and unaccompanied children because they already have relatives here. And so again, we're seeing a new influx of Hondurans largely coming because of the violence in Honduras and Central America. And there are community groups that are working to try to both protect those individuals as well as to fight for their asylum claims. So take home, there are Latinos in New Orleans before Hurricane Katrina. 
It is not a homogenous community. Um, it is multi-class as well as a complicated racial setup. And that one should not try to group all people who speak Spanish under a single moniker, but they have separate histories and they come for different political reasons. So, thank you. Well, of course, as you pointed out, war and political upheaval, of course, is one of the great pushes that forces people, of course, into the United States. Very much true. But the Vietnamese uh, immigrants and market, and if you can just take a minute. It's a, it's a very good segue. But let me also thank everybody for coming out such a a blustery day that we could hear the session. So when we started out, David kind of offered this um, this theory of push-pull that is a way to think about migration. I think my, my first thought was, I think this is a really nice way to frame ideas. My second thought was, there's going to be nothing in common with the Vietnamese experience you know, to, to these other groups that we're talking about. So it is a first, uh, my first thought was correct. I think that that was a, a nice orienting uh, framework. My second idea was completely wrong. You know, after listening to my colleagues present, there's a, there's a lot in common between So I think you got it. You know, the push pull idea is that something bad happens in the country of origin that wants to, that pushes people out that they, that they need to leave, and then the pull part is the attraction of the U.S. You know, as a place to, um, to to come for those people. And there was a lot of push for the, the Vietnamese. They came from the U.S. There were very few Vietnamese in the U.S. before the fall of Saigon in April 1975, and the, the, our southern um, allies in that conflict who lost needed to get out fast. You know, as the Northern Army you know, came marching down into Saigon um, during, that, um, during that period. So they needed to get out of town really, really fast. And they did. And the U.S. was very helpful in, in getting those folks um, out of, of, of Vietnam and into the U.S. And so what happened was that you know, this, this, uh, the Vietnamese exodus is usually described in three ways. So this first wave was the elites. Um, if, if you were going to work with um, first the French and then the American elites, you needed to be French, you needed to be Catholic. Uh, and so um, the, when they ended up in the U.S., uh, mostly Fort Chad, you know, they ended up a lot of Fort Pendleton as well, um, they were trying to figure out where to go. And so the Archbishop here in New Orleans, when he you know, was, realized what was happening, he went and you know, basically made the pitch, we are the Catholic city in, in the U.S., and you know, whoever wants to come will we'll find this space for you. So you know, Catholicism was actually a, a pretty good tool for this initial wave of, of so the New Orleans was one of the very first enclaves of, of, for the Vietnamese in the U.S. It's not the biggest, we're about 10,000, several hundred thousand in the in Southern California, about another hundred thousand or so in Houston, those are, but those are the biggest ones. But we were one of the first. And so when they settled here, uh, New Orleans used to be a really big, a much bigger city than it is now, 700,000 or so in the early 1960s. And as the city began to depopulate, there was a lot of very high quality Inexpensive housing, especially out in eastern New Orleans. And so there's a lot of Section 8 housing that's available there. So the Vietnamese, you know, when first came, and that far corner, you know, of, of eastern New Orleans, New Orleans, there was this uh, public housing complex called Versailles Arms, where they had, you know, had their, the initial group of, of, of folks come, and then as they you know, worked hard, accumulated money, and started to buy, up, buy property in the surrounding area, you go out there now, you know, most of the homes are Vietnamese, all the signs are Vietnamese, and it really, really is a Vietnamese enclave. So the first folks who came over were very accomplished, highly skilled um, elites, you know, who came, who came out of, uh, of, of South Vietnam, kind of make that initial toehold out in Eastern New Orleans. The second wave was, as things started to get really bad in, uh, in, throughout Vietnam <coughs> after, after the war, um, we had a couple of really horrible conflicts with China, that Vietnam you know, get there uh, very badly in, the U.S. You know, uh, kind of led the push to kind of have them Strange from the work of the rest of the world economy, it was very, very poor. So a lot of people were one unhappy with communism, and then two very unhappy with the economic conditions. And that's what happened to the, to the boat people. You know? So um, a lot of them went by boat. A lot of them also went overland across um, Vietnam, Cambodia, and Thailand. You know, the risks were just as great there. So about a million or so made it, mostly to the you know the end of the, in the U.S., but also France, um, Australia, and Canada to kind of fair number of refugees. Well, but you know, the bulk of them came here. So what they benefited from was this, you know, this very accomplished first wave of settlers who came here. And you know, they didn't have any money when they came. They had to give all that up to be to get a on, on the boat. Of course, all their property well, was confiscated once they left Vietnam. But they had a lot of know-how about how to get 
time. They kind of reestablish the, the community structures at that time. Needed to, to um, that they needed to, to, to thrive as a community. And the church was one of the big was one of the big ones. So this group that came over was largely Catholic, but also fairly diverse. A fair number of Buddhists, Confucianists, Count Dias, who were a pretty wide range of folks, and they all kind of had their individual, you know, small churches who scattered, you know, most of the East Bank and the Nurse community as well. But that mayor of the Vietnam church that they were uh, uh, able to build in the mid 1980s ended up being crucial, you know, for the, the way that the community ended up thriving, especially after Katrina. And that's the issue that I that I've been mostly um, I'm interested in. So on the pool on the pool part, there's very little that's attractive to Vietnamese about the United States. They just all push. It's difficult to imagine a more alienated place than America you know, for a Vietnamese person to come to. It's, as I was kind of getting really interested in Vietnam and the Vietnamese, I read um, Robert Owen Butler's Pulitzer Prize winner, Big Sick from a Strange Mountain, about the, the, the Vietnamese community throughout Louisiana and just how difficult those refugees were finding in, in this very different, very foreign, and very um, um, unnurturing um, environment. They pined for home. They got, they, none of them wanted to be here. They were grateful you know, that the U.S. reached out for the few to their for being killed, but extremely difficult experience for them to uh, get a settle in. A lot of the research that have been also been done indicates that this sense of alienation of the Vietnamese in America is, is quite high. Nevertheless, you know, they've done, I think there's a difficult of a campaign or two on the brush, and there are folks who make it, you know, folks who don't, just like they, you know, but, but, but by and large, they've done very well. Uh, our colleague at Tulane, Carl Langston, who wrote a wonderful, now classic volume for an American with, with me in the South, about how well the second generation is doing, in spite of the fact that you know, they've been really in a fairly poor section of the city, not in you know, very modest economic or circumstances. Uh, their parents don't, don't speak to speak English, and they're very isolated, you know, as a community out there. And all those things also, I thought, would conspire to make the Vietnamese recover not very well. After they very worried about them, you know, as many other people were. But as they have it, I, I was doing a study preparing those who came to America versus those who stayed back in Vietnam. Like the day, just a few weeks you know, before Katrina, the other day, you know, and so that, that was that was inconvenient in a lot of ways, but you know, when I kind of you know, drive off of my thoughts there, I realized, wow, there are these data that I had just before for the Hurricane Katrina. And so I can follow this this cohort that was came through time and kind of see how what they how they were before this event uh, you know, predicts or or uh, conditions how they do after so I had to use some data that the foster. I wasn't exactly researching it, but you know, I am now. I think we all are in that kind of through that. So anyway, kind of cut to the chase. Um, in spite of what I would have predicted, the Vietnamese did extremely well on post-Katrina recovery, much better than their neighbors, much better than the rest of us. PTSD for folks who um, experienced saw like a dead body, experienced flooding, or some other kind of reportable event, which were about a third of people who had experienced such horrible things ended up with measurable PTSD. For the Vietnamese, less than a high Unemployment, uh, extremely low, about a third of uh, what it was in other communities that experienced uh, similar levels of flooding, rates of return, much faster, much more complete than anyone else. On all these kind of bad standard measures post Katrina recovery, the Vietnamese did very well. So the, the work that I've been doing in the last um, five to, to ten years has focused on uh, the, the first part of it was you know, did they really do as well? You know, did, did, was, is it anecdotal or just a question or did they do pretty well? The data are not perfect, but the conclusion of that for me 
sciences had not really spent all that much time on studies of culture since the 1960s. The reason why is because in the 1960s, there's a big interest in culture as having an, uh, an explanation of why poverty is transmitted across generations. And a lot of social scientists would be, would be very offended by that, by, that, by, that, by that literature because it seemed to be blaming the victims you know, for intergenerational poverty rather than doing something about it. See that the, the, the field was neglected, and as I was trying to work my way through this one, you really can't get away from culture either. If we're going to talk about why the Vietnamese differ in the recovery from other groups, what distinguishes the Vietnamese from other groups is their Vietnamese, you know, it's, it's their culture, it's their shared history, you know, that they had together, and the way that this history uh, informs, gives give them a particular view of seeing the world, interpreting events, that the rest of us have got to turn towards culture and also some non-cultural uh, uh, features in this way. So let me just give an example of a uh, 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 basic metaphor. Uh, so one example, I'll give you a couple of examples. So this particular group in uh, New Orleans is especially interested because they're more Catholic than you know, other groups that come over. And so they trace their origins to the North. And so in 1954, the Geneva Accords had stopped the first war you know, with, with, with the French, divided Vietnam into two. The North went communist, the South went capitalist, and about a million Vietnamese who were, who were Catholic and afraid of being persecuted by the communists uh, moved down to the South, including the ancestors of this group in eastern New Orleans. And so they considered themselves to be northern Vietnamese before 1954, and so they had to move down to the South, reestablish themselves, and then they worked for 20 years until, you know, Communists were coming after them again, and so they moved, you know, um, you know, out of there, and they kind of reconstituted themselves here in New Orleans. And so they share these stories about how they ended up here with their children and grandchildren, and a big theme of that is we're survivors. We've done this before. We kind of give up everything and move, you know, uh, like twice now. Katrina really is a that big thing, that big challenge. We're, we're used to it. We're survivors, and these stories they tell, called the narratives in the literature. Uh, and then one, another kind of a, a illustration is what um, social scientists and anthropologists in particular call frames. You know, the, the, you know, these, these, experience, these shared experiences can be a particular lens of viewing the world that's kind of unique to your group. One that I've identified I've called the hierarchy. So after Katrina, when the rest of us were all kind of running in different directions, you know, they were refusing to make decisions about which neighborhood was going to get invested, which one wasn't, or where we were going to go. I mean, everybody was, was a complete free agent. The B2B squalor, of course, and some of the fights were really intense. But once they you know, came to a consensus, they had a leader, they were the head of the church, but they all fell into line. You know, so, so hierarchy is something that's, that's, that's um, I won't say that it's in their DNA, but it's, it's, it's in their culture. One of my B2B students describes uh, B2B's family structure as father and his best on steroids. You know, <laughs> Thank you. 
to make it easier to hire low-income workers, particularly um, Mexican and Honduran workers, which made, and New Orleans were not actually able to come back into the city at that time. So there were structural reasons as well. But there were large numbers of Latino immigrants coming to New Orleans. They faced wage theft. They would often get hired on the side of the road. They would then hire them, come build my house, come build X, and then they actually would not get paid. Um, others are told, you know, if you don't, you know, we're only going to pay you what we want. We're not going to pay you what we said we were going to. And one of the things which I found really inspiring since I moved here, there's a really um, organized and activist group called the Congress of Day Laborers. Um, they're very, very mobilized. They're a membership-based organization. There is a weekly meeting in Mid-City where about three to 400 Central American and Mexican immigrants meet every week. And they have organized at the city level as well as um, a sort of more the regional level. They have fought both against wage theft. They have fought um, against ice holds and the jails. They fight for asylum for Central Americans who are coming in. Um, and they've even fought sort of at the city and state level. Um, they're really sort of, I think, dynamic group of trying to actually fight against nativist sentiments. Um, and yet they, particularly with the national politics, it is both sort of at a local as well as national level that they are feeling that they need to fight back. Most of these workers are undocumented. Um, they speak in city council member meetings. They go and they are in marches and they <coughs> try to work with Hondurans and other Central Americans and Mexicans who are facing deportation orders. So there's a lot of nativism, um, but there's also a really inspiring example of grassroots member-based organizing as well in the city. So I'm happy to talk about that. One thing that really surprised me about nativism actually is the selective nature of it. Because, you know, there's always this divided mind. And, and you know, with the Sicilians, I mean, everybody knows about the Hennessy thing. But really, you know, um, Italians in general, and Sicilians in particular, and Wong's are well on their way to acceptance when the Hennessy things on hold, people forget that there are Sicilians in the Southern Yacht Club, and you know. Um, and it's, it, you know, so to juxtapose this, like, but there's this selectiveness with, because there's some political or economic utility in xenophobia. And, you know, like, do we, do we racialize xenophobia? Do we, do we think it is like some kind of inbred ethnic holding everyone's arm length, or, you know, I think it's really important to follow those other, other motivations. And, you know, I think a really useful way of thinking about this is sort of the consistent generation after generation after generation of abuse that this country has heaped upon black people, right? Which I think is very different. And, um, you know, your family could have been here since 1750, but you're always treated as an outsider. And, and so, to me, yeah, I think xenophobia is obviously very overall. Um, but the sort of negotiable space that xenophobia occupies, I think it's interesting. Yeah, and I wanted to also bring up a point of how communities deal with discrimination and what tools they have. And Mark touched upon that with the Vietnamese community. And I think it's important to kind of look at it the inside um, also. And so the Irish um, were, as I mentioned before, you know, there was extreme prejudice against them. And it wasn't, it was legal prejudice. If you were Irish and Catholic living in Ireland, you could not vote, you could not own land, you could not um, practice your religion, you could not be educated, you could not hold a profession, you could not hold a trade. Oddly enough, you couldn't own a horse worth more than five pounds. Um, and the, these laws went into effect from 1692 to 1760, and I always like to put that and mention that because it wasn't one parliament, it wasn't one law, it wasn't, you know, it was multiple ones, and they get more extreme over time, which tells me because they're not working. And so Ireland is 
so I think looking at how, where they're coming from, and how they employ those mechanisms, both that they have in them or that they develop here, is useful and to give that sense of agency that's coming from this, not just victimhood, um, and, to, and to consider, and to consider with each different um, Miami is on the rise. New Orleans doesn't have 
the boosterism essentially isn't enough, right? That the overall economy is shifting to a service model, trade has been Miami, oil is going to Houston, and New Orleans loses out economically at this time. So there's various business efforts um, but they are generally insufficient to actually stop that change. So my, my question is about historical, the question to you as a researcher is on this point. All this immigrants arrived in, in the city, in the country, with racial segregation, and later with civil rights movement, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What kind of attitudes and behaves did the migrants have? I can imagine that there were quite different attitudes from solidarity to indifference or to the will to identify themselves as a white dominant culture. Is, is this question you have also um, examined when working with these people? And how is it possible to, to have some history of, of this? Yeah, uh, certainly like when Sicilians start coming in really big numbers in the 1890s, 18, late 1880s, and into 1905, this is at the height of um, sort of the segregation machinery really being put into place in, in law. And at a time when Sicilian immigrants are filling into, you know, this kind of part of our landscape that's very different, the Duncan Plaza area. Um, which is full of little bars and, and back in town type stuff in the neighborhoods that African Americans like. To me, there are two really significant migrations to New Orleans after the Civil War. One is, one is Italian and a little bit German. And the other, of course, that there's still a book to be written about is this giant migration of African Americans coming from all over the rural South. And they're settling in the same neighborhoods. And so, you know, there is legal pressure put on uh, poor immigrants. You have a law called Gay Shadow passed in 1909. It's a liquor law. It, it requires you, if you're opening a bar, to declare whether you're going to serve black or white clientele. You can be black and serve white clientele. You can be white and serve black clientele. But you can't have, and this is a male space, right? These are all men drinking together. But you can't have men together. But this is wantonly violated in the area where, you know where Rouse's downtown is? There was that place that got bulldozed to build those sort of box-like condominium structures there. And that was a place where the, the owners had a bar there. They were arrested like four times for violating gay shattuck because they were serving, uh, you know, um, African-American and, and Sicilian clientele at the same time. So there's pressure. There's a feel that this is, you know, like, the legal interventionism of one drop color line rules is very powerful and it uses the mechanism of the law. That scares a lot of immigrants because they didn't come here to become violators of the law. And they didn't come here to get caught in the jaws of another oppressive system. And so I think a lot of them go back, but I will say throughout the 20th century, the Sicilian restaurateurs have a very close relationship with the afro creole culinary <coughs> If you look at a lot of the chefs, like Nathaniel Burke, who was you know, legendary, um, worked for Joe Segreto's dad as a young man. He worked for Joe Segreto later in the 70s. So that's just one example. The restaurant Scalfani had a kitchen board after the American country went on to do their different things. So I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, I wanted to just mention something about the Irish um, immigrants and the Irish immigrants and the big wave times in the antebellum period. Um, they show extreme discrimination against the people of color. Um, they would literally, they, they forcibly took over the dray business or moving of goods, sometimes like knocking a driver off with a brick and taking it over. And because they were white, nobody, you know, nobody complained or the husband said there was no real repercussion to it. But, so that's in place and many of them join the Confederate Army and they fight for a variety of different reasons. Um, but what a lot of people don't think about is in the 20th century and the Irish Channel. And when I talk about the Irish Channel, I mean from like Jackson to the Muses or Jackson to Annunciation Square, Magazine to the River. And that's where St. Alphonsus is and it's kind of the heart of the original sort of Irish Channel. Adele Street is where Walmart is today. Um, and 
I was always told when I was writing my book that that neighborhood became black starting after the 1960s and into the 1970s because of the civil rights movement. And my research showed just the opposite. When you looked at the census records of 1900, 1910, 1920, 1930, um, there was vast majority black population. And then you read the sources and they talk about it as a sea of black on Adele Street, a holy street for Irish Channel people. It's like considered the heart of the heart of the heart of the Irish Channel. And so I thought, okay, so why do we have these, these stories that are you know, contradicting each other? And it's because in the late 30s, the St. Thomas Housing Project was built. And for those of us who were, lived in the city for a long time and knew when the St. Thomas Projects were, were around, um, and what we don't, people don't think about is that housing projects were segregated. And St. Thomas was just for white people. So the building of St. Thomas housing projects actually forced out the local black population of Irish Channel and brought in a huge white population. And then what happens several days <coughs> later, the civil rights movement and desegregation and, you know, and everything else is um, you have a bit of white flight and also had it because of people too. I feel you have to build a new house, you can't renovate a house, so you've got people going to the West End, to Kenner, and, and things like that. But so, so even in sort of memory of people there, there's a part that's been sort of erased um, and, and replaced um, within this, you know, place of lifetimes. And I found that was sort of interesting that it ebbs and flows, and it's not just one story, but it's always changing. And it's changed again, you know, since then. I'll make a quick comment about the Vietnamese. That's a great question. I mean, my, my, I'm still uh, thinking of uh, various aspects of it. So one of the uh, most powerful measures of what you're asking is kind of about underlying racism or, or prejudice is rates of intermarriage. You know, we have high rates of intermarriage between blacks and whites or Vietnamese and whites. Vietnamese and blacks are that, you know, that um, those, those thoughts are kind of dissipating. The Vietnamese have one of the highest rates of endogamy. Vietnamese marrying Vietnamese in any group in, in, in the U.S. Sometimes interpret that to mean the high levels of, of kind of maybe implicit racism. Maybe some, but I think a better explanation of that is kind of related to what I was talking about before. The, the, the first generation is so freaked out about the prospect of their kids becoming too American and, and, and adapting to this culture they find very alienating that one kind of break on it is to really pressure them to marry other Vietnamese to try to kind of keep some of that social group intact and that applies to as a group. Does that make sense? I would, so I, I'm sorry, I'm gonna, I know we're out of time, I'm gonna make my two cents as well. So one, I might actually disagree with you a little bit, more. and I would say, first of all, your question is excellent, and I think we can't understand immigration in the United States, just like Justin said, without actually understanding the relationship between African Americans and racism in the United States, and these two are really interconnected. And so if you go to the Amistad Center, which is on the Tulane campus, but it's an independent, you know, historically African American archive, you'll find records from the Urban League in the 70s, and a lot of, sort of tension between African American organizations and the Vietnamese as the Vietnamese are moving into New Orleans East. And you can see sort of questions about the civil rights movement, about the ways in which I would argue the city in some ways allow these two groups to be structured against each other, who gets the housing, who doesn't. So it creates sort of these internal racial dimensions that's worth probing. I would say on a more optimistic note, and I'll go back to the Congress of Day Laborers. This is part of actually the New Orleans Center for Racial Justice. Do not work for them. I, I don't even really even donate money, maybe I should. But that they, in fact, have a coalition. And what they've done as far as activism within the city is that they have tried to pair a African American civil rights group with Congress of Day Laborers with a guest workers program. And it's a really interesting model. The Stand with Dignity, the African American sort of coalition, Congresso is for undocumented workers, and the Guest Workers Alliance is for, for guest workers in the city. Um, because the idea is that these are interconnected problems, um, and so they're, in fact, um, trying to think about it more systemically in their activist networks, but very much because of the way that immigrants have often been pitted against African Americans rather than an alliance with. So thank you for your question. That kind of follow up is the story behind the parade of the Bar Indian. 
some answers. <laughs> Some DS here, but, but it is. I mean, there is the St. Joseph. We don't know they do that. We can speculate, but that's a really hard thing to talk about. I've attended a number in the last uh, half dozen years of uh, meeting uh, from Connecticut, a group for the big Polish American, Irish American, German American, Sicilian, mm -hmm. Italian American, and um, invariably the issue of today's immigration problems. Like there was always a, a need of the analysts who were somewhat um, more into ge genealogy than they were history to say that but our people came illegal. <laughs> now the way you describe it, I assume if you were Sicilian and you got on a lemon boat, or if you were Irish and got on a, a vessel that emptied cotton, that you just got on the boat and then you came here. Is that Immigration law changed dramatically in the early century. Yeah. Yeah. The way my grandparents came. I was going to say, the first immigration law is 1924. The only immigration law before then is from the Chinese yeah. Exclusion yeah. Act. So unless you were Chinese, everybody coming into this country came in legally before 1924. And a lot of them hear that argument is from people who are coming in before 1924. Um, and so, you know, that there was no legal or illegal to come. Period. In 1924, they decide they go back to the census of where they have the highest North American population, and they use that ratio as to how many people from Germany, how many people from Scandinavia, how many people from Ireland, and they specifically do it for that, that white, better immigrant to come in. Um, but before 1924, unless you're Chinese, it's relevant. Would it be fair to say that if you were Irish and you came here in 1880, you came here with an open border policy? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Can I give you one last funny anecdote? So I was thinking about trade. There's a lot of trade in Mexico in the, in the 1850s, and I was in the Treasury Department records of the archives, and there was some lab in the customs office who, who every time a, a ship came in from Campeche, Mexico, would spell it C-A-M-P-E-A-C-H-Y. And I thought, I want to write something about that, that the title is Everything's Campeche. <laughs> That I have flyers here and they're also out there. Tulane University on Tuesday, we can hear you with the sirens. Tulane University on Tuesday, we have an indigenous symposium. It's free and open to the public. Sovereignty and the state. So there's a lot of these issues, issues of sovereignty, what it means. Um, entitled Indigenous Challenges to Imperial Claims. The morning we'll deal with archaeology and history, but then we switch pretty much to contemporary, including an indigenous round table. Um, these are Louisiana tribe, tribal members, and a keynote, and looking forward to the research. It is free and open. It's at Tulane the Main Center. I have flyers or postcards up here. If you'd like to grab one, we have a website with the full programming, and as well as I put it on that kind of main table out there. So uh, it's a topic that doesn't get a lot of attention in Louisiana, and it should, and that is um, the indigenous communities, uh, not just historically, but who are still here among us today. Right. 
This is not true in Kenner and Jefferson Parish. So in Kenner and Jefferson Parish, the people who have picked up, they're far more likely to find themselves deported um, because of a traffic stop than they would be in New Orleans. Um, this, it just depends on sort of which parish you are in and the police. Um, also in Louisiana, we have one of the larger immigration detention centers, but it's not here in New Orleans, it's in Tensis. Um, and it is a place where people go before they are deported. It's specifically far from New Orleans, so it's hard for lawyers to get there. Um, there have been various immigrant rights clinics that have worked with those um, to go up to those sort of detention centers to see if people might have asylum claims. There are also, as you can imagine, um, more and more people are being picked up and deported in New Orleans as they are throughout the rest of the country. So New Orleans, um, I mean, one can be, you know, if you're undocumented, you can be picked up or could be faced deportation. Um, there was someone, and again, you could all look this up, you know, on NOLA.com, but there's an individual who was claiming sanctuary in a church, and I think he, in fact, he, he left after about, I think, two months. Um, what happens is that someone often, if they are out of status, will go into ICE hearings that they are not seen as a risk to the community, and people who are going to ICE hearings were then finding themselves then sort of on the track to deportation, even if they've been here for many years. So some things that people have been doing as allies was going with people to their ICE detention, um, people who are Anglo, people who are white, or people who have citizenship, were trying to accompany people to their ICE hearings so that they'd be less likely to be then put in deportation hearings. Um, so I would say that things are in flux, that things, if you are undocumented, are scary, um, that there is a community of allies who is interested in protecting undocumented workers in New Orleans as well as throughout other communities, but that it is dangerous and scary, um, and that the national picture is really important because immigration is a federal and administrative process. Even if you have an extremely supportive city or um, federal representation, um, senators, not that our senators I think necessarily would step in, but federal level politicians and city level politicians, in fact, cannot intervene in general once administrative policies are in process. So it is a very scary time for our community members who are not documented. Um, and there are fair, there are this several people working with them. Hang on just a second. I'm the moderator, and they have told me two different things. Time is up. I know I feel incredibly like. Okay.